This episode is one of a series in which we investigate the manifold ways in which people in the Middle East have attempted to control and utilize water over the course of history. My name is Dr. Ed Hayes, and I work as part of a team of researchers on the project Source of Life, Water Management in the Pre-Modern Middle East at Radboud University in the Netherlands. In this podcast, our main focus is on pre-modern Middle Eastern cities and the way that water was brought to them and used within them. But cities are difficult to study. Their systems are complex, and if they are still in use today, then their archaeology is rarely accessible for study. So today, we're going to look at the more complete evidence of a smaller settlement, a building complex which has been in use for 16 centuries, the famous White Monastery of the Coptic Saint Shenouta, located in Upper Egypt. To do this, I'll be talking to Louise Blank, Senior Lecturer in Late Antique Archaeology at the University of Edinburgh. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me in this podcast. So just to start with, what first made you interested in researching water? I guess a lot of archaeologists come across watery infrastructure in their work and and document it, but maybe less people decide to actually put, put the pieces of the puzzle together and think in a more connected way about water. So what spiked your interest? It really started with two main things. I've always been very interested in how settlements work in trying to understand settlements from a bottom-up approach. So I've been frustrated with how archaeology is done, um, not just in monastic archaeology, but in, in, in cities as well, especially in past uh, archaeological um, explorations, in that there's been a real focus on the monumental architecture. Um, so for monasteries, people were interested in churches, cities, people were interested also in churches and temples and so on. All, all these great big monuments um, that do look very impressive when you visit a site but they don't tell us very much about how a site functioned. And I really wanted to sort of start the lowest level and then try to understand what's daily life like for people who live there. And a really central aspect of that is understanding water supply systems. Um, it tells us a lot about, about the, well, everything from the life quality of the people who were, who were living at the site, but also, and perhaps most relevant for my work, it can actually tell us a lot about the organization of a site. Um, it can tell us how the site was, was, was managed, how it was run, um, but also how different, site, different parts of the sites were used. Um, location of pipes, for example, can help us understand certain areas. Um, and and that, was really, that was really what, what, what sparked my curiosity. Um, and then I thought it was fascinating that you could actually trace how, how the planning and sort of the architectural planning of, of water supply systems in that that uh, there has been a very, very careful thought out process in laying out how water was was brought to the site and how it was distributed and how it was used. Um, so you've worked on various sites, but you've spent quite a bit of time looking on this site called the White Monastery, which is in Egypt. So could you just tell us a little bit of basic information to get us started? Where is the White Monastery? What kind of environment is it based in? The White Monastery is located in, in Egypt. Um, it's in a part of Egypt called Upper Egypt, and it's about roughly about 600 kilometers south of, of Cairo. Um, the White Monastery is set not quite in the desert, not quite in the Nile Valley. It's just on the edge of the Nile Valley and the, on the western side of the Nile. And what kind of environment is that? What, what sort of, what does it look like? Um... What, what, it, what would it be like to live there? So it's this very interesting contrast between the White Monastery being perceived as being a desert monastery, but it is actually just on the edge of the cultivation. So if, if you visit the site today, what you will see is that you, you're in an area that is obviously very sandy. Um, you've got it's kind of the lower, lower desert, that's where, where, the, um, where the White Monastery is located. And then if you look towards the desert, if you look towards the west, you can see the, the mountains of, sort of the lower, lower plateau of, the, of what's basically the start of the Sahara is rising up. So that's Egypt's western desert. However, if you turn around, if you look the other way, then you look at the cultivated Nile Valley. Um, and the extent of the Nile Valley, the width of the Nile Valley would, would have been approximately the same today as it was in late antiquity. So it's really important to keep in mind that, yes, the White Monastery was, was located in the desert, but it was also 
just at the edge of the cultivation. And that's that's the two two type of environments that, that the inhabitants would have been interacting with. Um, and could you just tell us a little more about the, the sort of function of the site, uh, maybe a quick history of the White Monastery? So um, your, uh, your, le- your title is Lecturer of Late Antique uh, uh, Archaeology, but this is also a site that went into the Islamic period, as I understand. What, what's, the, what's the sort of brief history and importance of the site? So the White Monastery was founded in the 4th century, um, but was really made famous by, by its third abbot, Shinuta. And Shinuta was a very prolific writer of Coptic, and, and also he was a zealous anti-pagan. Um, he has left uh, numerous letters and sermons, and probably, as far as I understand, he's by far the largest corpus of, of Lindsay Coptic texts, um, and therefore a really important source to understanding Christianity, monasticism, but also just life and late antiquity. Um, we see the, the sort of heyday of the white monasteries is from the time of Shinuta's rule, where the monastery is transformed to quite a monumental site, um, a very large site. And, and it's not, it doesn't just consist of the white monastery itself, it was, it was probably part of what we can call a federation of three different monasteries, at least three monasteries. Um, the two other monasteries was another male monastery, um, the Red Monastery, located just north of the White Monastery, and also a site, a uh, monastic site in the village of the Thribe, which is just south of the White Monastery, um, which um, was home to, to female monastics. Um, we can also see at this time that that at some point around the five, the fifth century, and the white monastery grew to a size, um, the intramural size, um, grew to a size of around seventy five thousand square meters, which makes it one of the largest uh, monasteries in Egypt. And this is very, very large indeed for for a monastic site, um, and it looks like it it maintains a site a size into would be about the 8th century, um, and perhaps even into the 9th century. And then we see a gradual shrinkage in the monastery. So areas that were used for production in the past, they are now used for rubbish disposals. Other areas that were also part of the built environment are uh, used for burial. And we see this, this gradual contraction towards the main monastic church. This 5th century church was built under the rule of Sinuta, which still stands today. Um, so when we get to the point of the 14th century, we got textual sources that are describing the white monasteries being in ruins. Um, but at the same time, you can see there's still activity at the site. We got manuscripts with colophons that were produced in the 16th century. We've got traveling accounts that are talking about, about communities living inside the church itself. So basically what we see at some point of starting gradually in the 8th, 9th century, but then over the coming centuries with this, this gradual contraction until the point where the entire community, perhaps not necessarily a, a monastic community, but just a Christian community, is living inside the church. And that seems to have carried on all the way up until today, um, until, or at least until the 90s. In the late 90s, the White Monastery was reinstated as a monastery, and that was when the, the modern monastery was formed. And today is home to as far as I'm aware, some 20 odd monks and and around 50 novices or so. And it's, it's uh, continuously expanding. So we're looking at a site that has approximately 1600 years of continuous usage. And at, so 75,000 square meters, you say, at, at its height, that that really is <laughs> does sound like quite a considerable area. How many people are we talking about? Is it possible to um, estimate how many monks and non-monks might have been living? And when you say that, are you talking about the other two monasteries of the Federation or are you just talking about the White Monastery site itself? When I'm talking about 75,000 square metres, that's just the White Monastery. Um, When we're looking at the number of people, uh, we do have some textual sources, and this is quite an interesting point in that, We've got textual sources, um, one text in particular, the Arabic life of, of Shinuta, which is this uh, hagiographical text um, reporting on the, the miracles performed by Shinuta. And this text does, does talk about 
about how many um, monastics lived in three different monasteries, and it's a, it's a very very much an inflated number. Um, I try to to do some calculations based on the space that we have available um, to to estimate how many people would actually live in the monastery. Um, and looking at the rules of Shinuta, so so the the monastic rules that were written um, by Shinuta, or, or at least they were collected um, at the time of Shinuta. Um, one of the rules states that, that all monastics should be able to eat together once a day in the refectory. So we have a building that we have interpreted as being a refectory. And then what I tried to do was to calculate how many people could actually fit into the space by comparing to um, especially the, the uh, monastic side in the river, the, the female monastery, where we do actually have seating remains. So, so looking at at that space in the Tripa, then sort of transporting the figures to the White Monastery gives us an estimate of a maximum of 500 people who could have, have actually eaten that refectory at the same time. And that's probably quite sort of a generous number. So somewhere below 500 monastics at the White Monastery, um, I would say. Now, how many lay people were at the monastery is a completely different question and one that I cannot answer. We have, we have, have, have sources from from other monasteries that that refer to lay people, servants, and so on. Um, but it would be a complete guess whether they were actually present um, at any point in time in the white monastery and how many there were. Right, but we're not talking about a a small pocket of hermits living in a in a cave. We're talking about something that's a significant. Uh, bustling settlement um, with probably quite a significant economic footprint. Yes, um, we should probably think about about the the white monastery as being the size of a as of a large of a large village. Um, and if you're looking at the built environment, then you can see it is it is very well organised indeed. We got structures that are clearly designed to for a specific type of production. Um, there seems to have been a fairly substantial level of, of uh, oil production. Um, we also got other areas um, designed for food production, and and they all very very neatly lined up. We can really see how carefully these areas were planned. Um, so, for, to give you an example. If we're looking at the monastic kitchen area, um, we've got seven bread ovens that are lined up right next to each other. So it's very clear that there's a lot of planning that's got into this monastic community. It's not a matter of having a settlement that's just sort of gradually grown up. There's, there's actually been someone who's been sitting down, drawing a plan of which building should be where, and then um, they've been built. So is there anything else we need to know about the site, the archaeological site, and then... What can we see of the water supply? Maybe starting off with the sources, like where did the water come from that people were drinking or using in this production? I think one thing that's really important to just state about, about the monastic site is that I mentioned that it's approximately 75,000 square metres. About 25% of that has been excavated. Um, for any, any listeners who are archaeologists, they would know that that's a very high percentage. That means we have a fairly good idea of its layout. Um, it's mainly the central part of the monastery that's been excavated, but that gives us a good, a good, clear, uh, a good opportunity to to study um, the water supply system. Um, so, talking about the sources for the water, we we have two wells, and one one well is located about. 100 meters northwest of the um, of the monastic church, and the other well is located inside the church. Now, I think when people are thinking about wells, commonly they think about this sweet little structure with a bucket. That's not what we're looking at here. This is monumental architecture, and it um, has required very skilled labor, a very careful planning and also someone with very detailed know-how of how to actually construct wells. So the main well, for example, um, if you're looking at the top, it's rectangular in shape. It's about six by eight meters. Um, and then the current water level is about 12 and a half meters below the, below the surface. 
we don't know how deep the well is because uh, unfortunately it does serve a bit today as as sort of a place where where rubbish will naturally accumulate since it's, it's just a great big pit in the, in the ground so we've got to lay our plastic bags which means we can't really we can't really get into into the well itself to measure step which is a shame but with 12 and a half meters um from the surface to the water level um, if you look at the construction of the well itself it's made from a combination of ashlar masonry um, cut back um, bedrock, so that's a cliff that you you, you find underneath the uh, the layers of sand and soil, um, and 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 fired red bricks, and it's a really impressive piece of architecture. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, perhaps I could just go straight on to talk about how water was lifted from the well. Um, so if you're looking from the top of the well, then on the east and the west side, you've got these transverse arches, and you're looking at these arches, and you can see wheel marks. And that's that's a, a telltale sign of, of how the water was actually lifted out. Um, in Egypt, from as far as I'm aware, from the first century uh, BC onwards, um, this this type of lifting device called a sakia um, start being used. And basically, a sakia um, consists of two gear drives that are set into each other at right angles and then then the the horizontal gear drive is pulled by by an ox or by a cow or a donkey some piece of burden and then that will move the vertical gear drive which is actually sitting inside the well and attached to the vertical gear drive we have what's called a pot garland and the pot garland is a it's a very long rope um, where you tie either buckets or pots onto and that they will as the gears uh, move, the, the pot garland will dip into water inside the well and then pull the water out of the well. And then as the pots, they go over the top of the wheel, they will be emptied out into a channel. And then from there on, water will be distributed throughout the monastery. What, what kind of pots were used? Are these clay pots we're talking about? or We're talking about clay pots. Um, they are quite distinctive. Um, they, they, they're called, uh, commonly they're known as, as, as sakia pots or, or kadu pots. Um, and you can tell what they've been used for because of their shape. So um, they, can't, they can't stand on their own. Basically they've got, they got a little bit of a rim at the top and they, they've got a knot at the bottom where you can tie a rope around. So, so that you can tie a rope around the bottom, you can tie a rope around the top. And that's, that's what, what they've been used for. And we find them on site, we find them broken, we find them scattered. Um, we don't have any other um, remains of the Sakia besides from the wear marks on the well itself, um, the construction technique of the well, which, which shows us how water was lifted, and then, of course, these, these pots. Um, and they vary considerably in size. So I think the smallest would have been about four and a half, uh, containing about four and a half litres. But... but um, at other size, uh, sites, they've been found um, to a size that could contain up to up to 15 litres or more. So you need animals to do this then? You, it's not, um, there's not a, a regular source of water that doesn't, that can just be lifted out uh, without some kind of, me this mechanical aid. It's, it's, I guess the other, otherwise you'd have to go a couple of, cu couple of kilometres to the Nile to get a, a, a sort of running source of water that would be the alternative um i'm sure there would also have been wells um in the nile valley itself in settlements but but this is the only source of water in the white monastery and for the listeners who do not know of egypt then i think it's perhaps important to just mention that it does not rain at all the annual rainfall is something along the lines of 30 millimeters and the evaporation rate is is uh, many 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 times that so so the rain it, it fall is, is insignificant when it comes to everything from aquaculture to drinking water it would not be be a reliable source of water so it has to come from the ground and you mentioned another um well um a well in the church do you want to talk about that now or, or yes or, I is, can is do that, that rather a um rather a perplexing idea that that is this something that existed as part of the church infrastructure or something that was dug later? Why would it be in a church? 
That's a very good question. Um, we don't know the date of the well inside the church. It's not really been possible to examine it in detail. In its current shape, it's, it's covered by a very big metal lip. You can't really see it. There's a little hatch on top, so you can just about peek inside. Um, and what we have been, been able to see is that it's a round well, and there are also remains of transverse, uh, transverse arches, which means that a secure gear drive would have been used to lift water from this well as well. Um, other than that, we don't really know that much about it. Um, what perhaps is very interesting is that since it's a round well, it could have been constructed using the a well sinking technique, where rather than digging a great big hole, scaffolding everything off, and then 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 building a well up from there, what you do is you you build just one one um, part of the well at a time, and then you actually sort of uh, dig underneath that part, so you, you sink the well down and you build on top until you reach reach the water level. Um, that means that you can you can basically build a well inside a standing structure such as a church. That would have been possible. Whether it happened that way or whether it was constructed at the same time as the mosque, I oh, sorry, mosque uh, church, I cannot tell. Um, what is interesting is that. It looks like the area immediately south of the church would have been supplied um, through pipes leading from the the, the church um, well. Um, and the date of those pipes is approximately it's 9th, 10th century that we're looking at, um, perhaps a little bit earlier than that. So it is possible that we're looking at a separate or even later system, but um, to be honest, I, I'm i very uncertain about, about the date, um, a date of the, of the well, as I said, simply because it's not possible to study it. Okay, that's fine. Well, let's talk about the, the system that um, it depends on the larger well. So that's it sounds like quite, a, as you said, a, a monumental structure. Is that producing quite a lot of water? And then how is it carried to different areas of the site? So it's quite speculative how much water could actually be pulled from the well for several reasons. One thing, as I said, is that we don't know how deep it is. And the other one is, is also that the, the speed by which the well was replenished um, we we do not know for sure how how quickly the the water carrying uh, layers in the ground would actually have refilled the, the well. Um, I I estimated that about sixty cubic met meters could have been taken from the well um, per day without without exhausting it as a resource, um, and that would have been more than enough to feed all the different needs of the monastery, so everything from cooking, drinking, to industrial processes. But what we see is when we're looking at, at the, the system that would have carried water throughout the site is that it, it consists of, of five different components. So we've got the pipes themselves that would have, have led water to where it needed to be. Then we've got um, what's called distribution boxes or inspection boxes, and I'll get back to explaining what they are in a moment. We've got the sedimentation tanks, which basically just for keeping water for settling, settling sediments so that all the impurities in the water will fall to the bottom. Um, and we've got clean water, which of course is preferable for both um, drinking, cooking, and also for various industrial processes. Um, we've got tanks and cisterns that are used for, for storing water. And then we've got also various installations for, for, for drainage. Um, the system itself is, is gravity fed, which means that the well, um, the head of the wells, is at the highest point of the monastery. And then basically the pipes um, just facilitates water running downhill. Um, it's not a very steep gradient, which means that water would probably run, be running quite slowly. Um, there are various ways in which one can, can increase the, the water flow. Um, perhaps we can talk about that later. Um, but it looks as if what happened was that water was just led to the different places where it would need to be. So there would have been some quite central organization in terms of pulling the water out of the well itself, and then it would be 
uh, let through these different conduits, um, these pipelines um, to, to where it needed to be. We got these dis distribution boxes, and distribution boxes is basically, if you imagine sort of a little tank that has one inlet and then several, several outlets. Um, I find these quite interesting because you, you can use them just to check if the water is actually flowing. You can also use it as an access point to the pipelines in case you need to clean the pipelines. You can also control where the water should go in one direction or go in all directions at the same time by just blocking off different pipelines. Um, that's not very sophisticated. You could probably just have used the, um, some rolled up cloth just to, 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 to block it with. And, and if you're blocking, for example, one exit point, then automatically you would get more water coming through the other pipelines. Um, inspection boxes uh, are quite similar to these distribution boxes. We find them just outside where, where water would enter a building. Um, and basically, we just it's just a little box with the lid on. You can take the lid off. Look inside. You can see there's an inlet and there's an outlet. So you can see the water is is, uh, is coming in through the the inspection box and coming and then flowing flowing out of the box and into into a building. Again, access point to make sure that water is actually flowing, um, and also an access point in case that you need to to clean the pipes. That's interesting. So, it, it this all speaks to what you said um, near the beginning, where where you're talking about this being a clearly planned site with the uh, the bread ovens and everything quite well regulated. The what you were saying about the gradient and starting with the well, uh, which obviously has to be dug down, but is at the, the situated at the highest point of the site. This is not just someone coming along and digging somewhere more or less at random to find water. It's it's somebody has planned this site and has decided where the, uh, where these pipes are going to go. I guess. And also, there's what you're saying about the inspection boxes as well. That that, that you're 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 devising a functional system that can be maintained over the long term. You're not just doing a sort of ad hoc. Um, oh, I better I better I better fix this problem that's arised. Is that is that uh, is that a correct interpretation of what you're saying? It's interesting the combination of those two because there's no doubt that in its initial layout. Is that we're looking at a very carefully planned system, and we're also looking at a massive financial investment um, of funding, as well as building materials and labour in actually setting up the system. We we're looking at a system that is set up by people who really do know what they're doing. This is not just uh, a group of monks who decide to dig a hole for to to make a well. And this is people who are used to working with water infrastructure who have actually laid out the system. But then what we do see as as the system is being used over time, it's quite an interesting approach to fixing things. Because one of the problems, of course, with pipelines is that you do need to maintain them. You need to, to make sure that, um, well, you don't want to leak, but that's actually the least of your problems. The main problem is a buildup of, of mineral incrustations and also of sediments. So looking at some of the pipes that are immediately to the east of the well, what we do see is that they just locked up over time to the point where you just had one or two centimeters right at the top um, which renders them largely unusable and then rather than trying to replace a pipe what happened was that someone just laid out a pipe right next to it to replace it and then did that again and again so we got this area with about four or five parallel pipelines and I can't really explain that in any other way in that someone has tried to fix a problem of, of pipelines um, becoming unusable just because of, of build up inside. Do we have any other comparative material to help us interpret this? What do, what do other pipeline systems at other sites look like? Largely the same if they're not maintained. Um, what you want in a pipeline is a fast flowing, um, well, a fast flow, because if your water is moving quite quickly, then it will remove the sediments. Um, so once in a while you want to really build up pressure and then you want to flush out the system. I guess there are other ways that you can clean up your pipelines, but it's very, very difficult and re requires having really good access to, to the pipes. So water is really by far the best, the best way. If we're looking elsewhere at site, it looks like we might actually see um, 
a system, uh, a later system, or a later addition to the system that was constructed in order to deal with exactly this problem, because we have sluice gates, uh, and not, not large sluice gates as you will see in a river, but tiny little sluice gates as you will see in a pipe. And what you do is you, you, you block it off, um, you block off the pipe, let the water build up, and then you lift the sluice, and then water flushes through, and that's a really good way to clean up your pipe. Ah. But we do not see that in the area right next to the well. We see that we do see that way, but right by the well. We do not see it right right by the well. We we only see that in other um, perhaps later parts of the water supply system uh, in the areas of south of the church. Ah, so they've they've seen there's a problem, and then in later uh, installations they decide to introduce a technique to fix it. That is my interpretation of what's happening. Yeah. Um, just so, just for clarification, how large are these pipes? How big? They're, they're quite small. Um, they vary in size, but in general, um, the pipes they consist of they're ceramic. Um, and they consist of the same type of elements. So each each element of the pipe would be the pipeline would be about sixty centimeter long um, and about seventeen eighteen centimeters wide. Uh, they're, they're round. Um, and then the slightly conical shape so that one end of one pipe would fit into to another pipe and then you secure where the two pipes meet with mortar. Right. So we're not talking about the famous, uh, famously poisonous lead uh, Roman uh, piping that poisoned inhabitants of uh, Roman cities. No, we don't. I mean, this is a... It is basically a Roman style water supply system that we're looking at, or even Hellenistic style Roman water supply system, but one that has been then elaborated upon in, in the Roman period. But the use of pipes is uh, very much dependent on the geography. In the Eastern Mediterranean, you see ceramic pipes. In the Western Mediterranean, you see lead pipes. Yeah. Um, in the Northern part of the Roman Empire, you see wooden pipes. Yeah. So it has to do with the material at hand. Yeah. Um, so silt build-up, we've mentioned. Are there other, any other maintenance issues that we see in the archaeological record? Any other challenges that the operators of this system faced? I think that the, the main challenge really has to do with, with, with the building up of, of sediments inside the pipes. Other other challenges, of course, has to do with transporting water to where it's needed. Um, I mentioned before that we got this probably central system that's organising the lifting of the water out of the well. But then there needs to be some quite careful management of making sure that the water gets to the part of the site where it needs to go. We find cisterns um, at various sizes. They're not particularly big. Um, but we do we do find cisterns in, in various parts of the monastery, so it looks like the water would be transported to where it was needed, and then it would be extracted from the cistern. So, for example, the kitchen has its own system. System. There's a there's another system where where we have evidence of pottery production. There's another system in a, in a third area of the of the monastery, and so on. Um, and this probably tells us that the water was lifted from the well not continuously but periodically. And then it was a matter of, of the people who were working in different parts of the monastery, for example, in the kitchen, to just make sure that they had enough water um, and, and make sure that their, their little local system was filled up so that they would not at, at any point run out of water. That makes sense as well in terms of the deployment of the resources of the monastery. If you have a, your, you don't necessarily have your water wheel donkey or your water wheel oxen there constantly, you might need them to do other tasks around the monastery I guess and then when it's when people's systems run out then you get your donkey on the job and <laughs> fill up and then fill up and until all the systems are filled. Yes I think that's that's a very good way of describing it. So we've talked about supplying water both for drinking but you also mentioned industry so what kind of industries are we talking about what kind of production went on the one type of production, or two types of production, the most easily recognisable have to do with with the dyeing of clothes uh, or fabric, and also with pottery production. Both of those um, types of production require water. We have um, remains of pottery production, pottery kiln, um, in the in an area north of the main well, 
and we have an area of a series of small tanks set in, in continuation of each other, which is currently interpreted as being related to, to, to dying, um, close dying in the, in the excavated area just in the south of the church. Um, then we also do have various other areas where we can see that there are lots of pipes and tanks and so on, um, but we can't base on the current archaeological remains really um, what has been excavated so far. We can't really say what, what they were actually used for, but it is usually a strong indication of some sort of industrial process happening if you find a lot of pipes and tanks and systems. Um, so pottery, for example, as I said, it was located just to the north of the area of the main well. You, you need water in the preparation of the clay, for example. Um, there are also various other stages that would require water. Um, and then, of course, you need to, to mix the dyes with water when you are, uh, are dyeing fabric. Um, we do also have several other types of, of production going on, but they, they have to do with food production primarily. They would not necessarily have required water. Um, we have things going on such as milling of flour. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have production of oil and so on. And neither of these processes would have, would have required water. But we do, of course, have a very large kitchen area. And that would have been a major consumer of, um, of water. OK, so we've talked a bit about um, usage of water. What about the um, waste water? Presumably... Uh, we have toilets, we have also runoff from these, perhaps these industrial activities. What, um, yeah, how was the wastewater managed? Well, considering how much we know about the distribution of water and the lifting of water outside of the well, we actually know very, very little about wastewater. We do have this structure that by past archaeologists were interpreted, um, we have a structure that was interpreted as, as being a toilet block in past archaeological studies, but um, when I was working on the site as, as a part of, of the Yale Monastic Archaeological Project, uh, we revisited this particular feature and it's very clear there's not a toilet block. So we don't actually know where the toilets were, we don't know where the latrines were. This is uh, it's much, much more likely to be air shafts or even, even windows um, sitting right next to, to an industrial area. We only got three, maybe four examples um, of, of elements of drainage, um, and they all soak away. And so soak away in this case, that's, um, it's basically, uh, at the White Monastery, it means that we've got a pot that's uh, set uh, either upside down or, or with its, its bottom knocked out, and the water was let into this pot, and then it was just slowly drained into, into the ground. And we find these circleways immediately outside of buildings. Um, so, for example, the area that's been interpreted as a, as a dye shop, um, we've got the, the end wall of the building, a series of tanks inside the building, and a pipeline leading from the last tank out through the wall of the building into the circleway, and then it would be draining into the ground. Um, this is quite interesting because it tells us that very little water has actually been used there. You can't, you can't let out masses of water into the ground. Um, um, through a circle way like this because it would it would undermine the foundation of the building and eventually you know, the, the last thing you want to have in the foundation's water because that means that the sediments will shift and your building will collapse eventually. Um, there must have been some level of of drainage there on a much larger scale, considering how much water was pulled out of the water uh, out of the well, sorry, um, there must have been some level of, of drainage, and we just have not been able to identify um, in the archaeology yet. If you're looking at, if you compare with cities, for example, then you would have central sewers that would be leading the water out of the cities. Um, we also have collection of water, I guess, for being used to to water, water agricultural areas, for example. Um, but we simply do not have any, any evidence of that of the, of the White Monastery. So that's the element that we're missing when we're looking at the water supply system. Otherwise, we do have every single element from the point of, of lifting the water out of the well to the point of storing it where it was used. But, but when it comes to drainage, then we are a bit in the dark. And is that, um, is that a function of 
the nature of the archaeology that it's difficult to find this or is, is this something specific to this site or is our uh, waste uh, water features diff just generally difficult to find or uh, and and can you tell is it easier to tell between the, so the pipes you're talking about is it easy to tell the difference between something that's bringing water and and um, taking it away is that a cl clear clearly visible feature so let me start by answering the question about the pipes and uh, not necessarily in theory you can use feeder pipes as drain as drainage pipes so the pipes that are feeding water to one part of the monastery, they could also be used, that the same type of pipe could have been used to take water away. So what, what I'm really looking at when I'm determining whether a pipe is a feeder pipe or a drainage pipe has to do with location. So if you can see that it's leading to a system, for example, or leading to a production area, then it's probably a, a feeder pipe. Um, I think it has more to do with, with where excavations have taken place at the White Monastery. So to give you a little bit of a background to, to the Yale Monastic Archaeological Project that I was part of, rather than doing a lot of excavations ourselves, we were, we were basically revisiting excavations that were carried out by, by the then Supreme Council of Antiquities, um, who opened up very large excavations areas, um, five very large excavation areas, and all quite centrally located in the monastery. Um, and we were recording what had been excavated there, um, trying to get to grips with the architectural stratigraphy and in some cases having very small excavations, keyhole excavations of just a couple of, of, uh, of square meters in order to get to grips with what was actually going on. So that means we don't really have any of the edges of the monastery that's been excavated and that, that would perhaps be where we would expect to find the main drainage channels. So it's probably a combination of the two not necessarily being able to recognize um, what a pipe is just one or the other, and the other point being the, the areas in which excavations have been taking place. That makes sense. Um, so how, how can we sort of assess the uh, relevance of the site of the White Monastery for thinking about water management systems in, in pre-modern North Africa and the Middle East more, more broadly? Is it is it a unique site? Is it largely representative of um, what we think would be happening in other sites in the area? If we're looking at, at, at cities, for example, if we're looking at most settlements, we would usually just have a few of the elements represented in water supply systems. So what's really interesting about the White Monastery is that we actually got all the stages. And that, that is really unique. But the different elements in themselves are very common. So we, we find wells with Sakia gear drives all over Egypt. Pipelines are common throughout the Roman world, throughout the Hellenistic world, and, and also into the Islamic world. Um, distribution boxes and, and inspection boxes and so on, uh, cisterns, are also very common elements. So it's, it's really a matter of having the whole system together. And then, of course, what we need to keep in mind is that if you imagine that when you're planning a water supply system, you've basically got a list of elements that you can choose from. And then you adjust, you make a system from all the different elements available to you to fit your specific site. So you think carefully about what is it, what are your needs at this particular site? Um, what are you going to use water for? It's a bit like when you're planning your electrical system in a, in a modern house. Yes, you can make some modifications later on, or your piping system and so on in a, in a modern house, but you need to think very carefully about how you're going to use the different spaces. Um, so it is it is both unique and representative at the same time, if that makes sense. And I guess you already already alluded to some of this, what might be specificities of the site, this thing about the shallow gradient and the fact that the pipes are silting up because you don't have that flow. And in other sites, I guess you have perhaps less silty water or or just the flow is is greater. And so you don't have that sort of distinctive build up. It varies from site to site. It's a very, very common problem with pipes throughout any site, really, that pipes will sealed up. If you don't if you don't maintain them properly, they will sealed up. Um, that's not unique to the White Monastery. That is, is uh, commonly found throughout any, anywhere that pipes are used. Right, great. Um, and in terms of the sort of long history of the usage of the site, 
well, or or other sites just in general that you've looked at, do we see a change in technique or in technology or in management from the the Roman period into the Islamic period, or is there is it is it more a question of continuity, or is there are there are there some ruptures that we see? We are largely looking at continuity. This is a system that works really well, as well as as long as it's maintained, then it it works really well. Um, again, it's a type of system that's adjusted from site to site, but the basic elements they remain the same. And the Sakia Gear Drive, for example, is used today. Right. Uh, perhaps less so today because we have we have mechanical pumps, but but it's it's, it's commonly used until at least into the nineteen early twentieth century in various parts of Egypt and Sudan um, and, and probably also other parts of North Africa. Um, so. I would say that we are looking at a system of, of long-term continuity. Right. That makes sense. Though I know that you've written about um, the decline in uh, multi-seater toilets, but multi-seater public toilets, that that's one thing at least that changes with, with the, the Islamic era. That's true. That's true. I wouldn't call it decline. Let's just call it the transformation in the in perceptions of, of, of privacy and, and, um, and bodily behaviour in public. Yes, yeah, makes sense. My co-producer of this podcast, Jauke Heringha, was doing some reading about the White Monastery and he mentioned that several sites in Egypt have been having problems because of the rising in water table due to the Aswan High Dam. Is that a problem that we see in the White Monastery? That's a really interesting point. Um, so the, the Aswan Dam is causing massive problems for lots of other sites, especially those that are located in the Nile Valley or in cities like Cairo, for example. All Cairo um, was flooded until um, a very elaborate drainage system was, was put in. It's not a problem in the... Uh, the White Monastery, because it's located at a plateau just above the the agricultural um, green Nile Valley. So it's about it's raised about six meters above the the archaeological remains are raised about six meters above the the, the floor of, of the Nile Valley, um, and that is enough to ensure that that the archaeological remains are actually not affected by by the uh, by the raising groundwater. But it's actually an interesting point, and, and one thing that might be worth including in the podcast, if, if it can be fitted in, is um, that, of course, before the construction of the Aswan Dam, then the, the Nile uh, would, that would be the, the, the annual inundation of the Nile, um, at which point the, the Nile Valley would have been largely flooded. Um, this would have happened through what's known as basin irrigation. Um, where you trap the water in very large basins, basins when you think of perhaps about sort of, you know, bathtub basins. That's not what we're looking at in the Nile Valley. We're looking at, at uh, basins that are 100 of, of, of uh, square kilometres. So the White Monastery, for example, the, was located just at the edge of one massive basin um, that would have trapped water for about four months of the year before then a dike was broken and the water was led into, into another basin. Um, that means the White Monastery for four months of the year would have been sitting at the at the edge of a um, of a very big lake. Um, it also meant that uh, that the water inside the wells would have risen with the inundation of the Nile and then also fallen um, as as the water would have gone down. Well, I think that we've got through lots of really interesting stuff. Is there anything else you'd like to mention at this point? Other sites that you've been working on or um, other things that you missed uh, saying while we were talking? I think in terms of the White Monastery, we, we covered most of the basic points. Um, I do work on other sites as well. I work in Jerash in Northern Jordan. Of course, there we're looking at a completely different water supply system because it's a city. And what is perhaps unique about the White Monastery is that because it is, in monastic terms, it's a very large site, in terms of settlements, it's a small site. So that's why you can actually just have one or two systems that can be centrally managed. If you're looking at a city the size of Jerash, for example, we're looking at something like 
800,000 square meters. Um, it it has a completely different level of water supply systems. Here we're looking at, at aqueducts combined with, with natural springs. We're looking at massive pipelines and we're looking at, at, at underground systems um, that would have been storing water. But interestingly, we've got very few pipes, for example. We've got, um, we, we, we do not know very much about how water was distributed throughout the site itself. We do, of course, have a very elaborate central sewage system, um, so we can see how water was um, was let out of, of specific buildings, for example, bathhouses, how it was let out into the main main sewers, and how the sewers then would have drained into the into the river um, or out of the city. Um, we've got two different different sewage systems, um, so that's just a whole different scale. It's a whole different scale, but if you're breaking it down into sort of the individual elements of having a source of water, having distribution, having storage, and so on, then then it is the same idea, but on a very different scale. Thank you. Well, just to finish up, um, I'd like to sort of reflect on, well, I guess the uses of history and 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 what uh, what we can gain from thinking about water management in the past. We we live in a time of water crisis, at least in, in many places in the world. Um, so what what kind of insights do you think we can gain from this kind of study? I think the main point we can take away when we are looking at the water supply system of past sediments is that water is treated as a very precious resource. And one thing we probably tend to do today, at least in certain parts of the world, is treating water as if... It's an inexhaustible resource, and certainly it's not. And we can see, looking at the White Monastery, but also looking at other sites such as Jerish, is that water is very, very carefully managed, and it's very carefully used. And I think that's probably the main thing that we can that we can learn from the past. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's been a really fascinating discussion, and good luck with your ongoing excavations. Thank you very much for having me. And that's all from us today. Thank you for listening.